The president of Mexico visits President Biden at the White House today. Front and center will be the crisis on the U.S.-Mexico border, where historic numbers of illegal migrants have parts of Texas declaring a border invasion. Relations between the two leaders are already tense after President Obrador snubbed an invitation to the Summit of the Americas in Los Angeles last month. Washington correspondent Tara Mergener has more. In May alone, nearly 240,000 migrants breached the U.S. border. 25 percent of them who'd previously been arrested and deported. The White House says President Biden and Mexican President Lopez Obrador will discuss ways to slow the staggering numbers as concerns mount over a crisis growing worse by the day. We're seeing a historic crisis. Critics charge Biden's policies are to blame for the unprecedented numbers, which include a 20 percent spike in unaccompanied children. Former acting Secretary of Homeland Security Chad Wolf spoke with CBN News. The word is out around the world that if you want to come to the United States illegally, your best bet is to do so along the southern border. The record number of people now coming from more than 150 countries further across the globe. These are people from Bangladesh, from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Russia, from uh, all over the, the Middle East. In Texas, several counties have declared a border invasion as migrants continue to flood the state. Lopez Obrador has blasted Governor Abbott's order, allowing the National Guard and state authorities to send them back to the border. President Lopez Obrador, he could keep them out of Mexico if he wanted to, but he does not want to. He wants to funnel them into the state of Texas. Many also charge Biden's open border policies are allowing drug cartels to move massive amounts of illicit drugs quietly into the country. Meanwhile, the Supreme Court ruling giving the administration the right to end President Trump's remain in Mexico policy could make the situation much worse. The Biden administration has a big choice to make. They are either for the rule of law they are either for American communities and they can reinstitute a program they know that works. One topic sure to come up is the death of 54 migrants left in a truck in San Antonio last month. Lopez Obrador is seeking more migrant worker visas from the Biden administration, so fewer people will have to take the chance of coming over illegally. He also wants to talk about inflation and security. In Washington, I'm Tara Mergener, CBN News. Well, the new administration's policies are absolutely a giant advertising sign saying, please come to America, please come to the southern border. And until they take that advertising sign down, we're not going to see a change in, in this current crisis. The numbers are absolutely staggering when you say between two and three million people every single year are crossing. And this has been going on since the inauguration back in January of, of 2020. It seems like a long time ago in the pandemic, but that, these are huge numbers. How can any community kind of absorb this many people coming in? There is a rule of law, and if you're not going to enforce immigration laws in the United States, then what are you doing in the administration? It's your job to enforce them. And if you don't, why are you at all surprised that the governors of the border states are saying we need to take things in our own hands? In other news, Iran is coming to Russia's aid in the war against Ukraine. John Jessup has that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. Iran plans to send Russia hundreds of unmanned aerial, vehicle, aerial vehicles, including drones capable of carrying weapons. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan told the White House Press Corps that Iran will also provide training for Russian forces as early as this month. Today, the Kremlin announced Russian President Vladimir Putin will visit Iran next week for a summit, including Turkish leader Recep Erdogan, over the situation in Syria. Meanwhile, Ukrainian forces apparently destroyed a Russian ammunition depot near Kherson last night. Analysts say the video suggests the Ukrainians deployed U.S.-supplied rocket systems to carry out the strike. Well, many of the millions of Ukrainian children scarred by the horrifying sounds and images of the current war have fled to Poland. To ease their trauma, a CBN Superbook team from the Philippines went there to bring them God's word and a fun escape with a familiar face. Lucille Toulousan reports from Poland. It was for the sake of our children. 
That is the response from Ukrainian mothers when asked why they decided to leave home and be separated from their husbands left behind in Ukraine. It was so hard to leave the most important people in your family, but our children wake up to the sound of the bombing at 5 in the morning. It is not safe for them anymore. Marina Rilova and her family live in Kharkiv, the second largest city in Ukraine, a major Russian target. She and her three children have been staying in a shelter in Poland for three months. Marina shares how her nine-year-old son, Roma, is giving her strength. The older sister was crying with the situation, but Roma didn't cry because he thinks he is now the man in the family and so he should be brave. According to child psychologists, though, the effects of war on a child can last for a very long time. And this is why Superbook Philippines head Iko Gonzalez says he pushed to bring Gizmo along with the Superbook team to create happier memories for these Ukrainian children. And that's what I noticed about the kids here. They all just want to feel loved. They just, they just all want to feel that there's somebody there for them, knowing that you know, their, their parents are probably fighting the war in Ukraine. Roma, along with the other children, enjoy the games and other fun activities provided by the team with the help of the Superbook Ukraine staff. During the three-day camp, they were also delighted to watch Superbooks in the beginning and to meet Gizmo, who is known to them as Robic, for the first time. He was so excited to share with the family all the information he learned from Superbook. He learned not to be shy to people, forgive people. Through to the theme song of Superbook, what they're bringing to the kids is the Word of God. And as the song goes, His words forever alive, Superbook. There's one thing that will stay with them forever, and that's what really what we want to leave with them, and that is that hope can be found in Jesus. So this is Anya and this is Nassar. And did you have so much fun today? Yeah. Yeah. And what did you learn? Uh, God loves. God loves. Positive. I want to thank you all for making this program for the kids. It helps them to somehow forget the situation in Ukraine and what has happened to them. It makes them happy to see all of this and to live this life with hope. I like watching the movie and playing games. My favorite is in the beginning, the fight between God and the devil. God created the whole world. He is powerful and he could stop the war in Ukraine. After this interview, Marina and her children went back to Kharkiv to be reunited with her husband. It is still not completely safe in their city, but they go back with a renewed confidence that God is with them. Lucille Talusan, CBN News. Cheshov, Poland. Thanks, Lucille. With all those kids have seen and experienced, Gordon, it's good to see the smiles on those faces. And if you're a member of the 700 Club, you're responsible for those smiles. Because of you, because of your gift, we're able to bring the team all the way from the Philippines to that refugee area in Poland. Uh, we want to help the refugees. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. How much is that? It's just $20 a month, that's 65 cents a day, and you're joining tens of thousands of people that say, yes, let's make a difference. When there's war, let's help the children who are most impacted by that. Let's be there for them. Let's bring smiles to their face. That's you when you're a member of the 700 Club. So if you're already a member, thank you. Those are your gifts at work in Poland. President Biden is headed to Israel and Saudi Arabia tomorrow. The trip could lead to more peace agreements in the Middle East and build on the Abraham Accords established by the Trump administration. Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem. One aim of the trip, according to President Biden, is to deepen Israel's integration in the region. He also said that Israeli leaders came out strongly for my going to Saudi. Biden's relationship with Saudi Arabia, however, has been strained. After taking office, he released a CIA report blaming the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi on the Crown Prince. 
and during the presidential campaign called the desert kingdom a pariah. Plus, he's expected to ask Saudis to produce more oil, hoping to reduce the high price of gas in the U.S. Yet many in the region also hope this visit can be one more step toward normalizing relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. One of the chief architects of the Abraham Accords, Jason Greenblatt, hopes the White House realizes the vital role Saudi Arabia plays in the region. He wrote about how the Biden administration can build on the historic achievement in his new book called In the Path of Abraham, How Donald Trump Made Peace in the Middle East and How to Stop Joe Biden from Unmaking It. Well, Jason Greenblatt joins us now for more. You were one of the main architects of the Abraham Accords during the Trump administration. How would you assess uh, the Biden administration and what it's done to build on those accords? Well, until this trip, I'd assess it pretty poorly. I think he's alienated a key ally, Saudi Arabia. He's done okay with Israel. He's been pretty cautious. I think this trip is going to be a very, very important trip. I hope he stands by our ally Israel, but I also hope he treats Saudi Arabia with the importance of it being an ally that we need. Uh, President Biden wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post, couldn't talk about oil, which he should have, couldn't really talk about Iran other than to say that he's working with the Europeans, which is a mistake. He should be working with Israel and Saudi Arabia and others in the Middle East. So uh, I think this trip will be very telling. I wish him success, but I am certainly worried. Uh, there's talk that the need for oil uh, worldwide as a result of the war in Ukraine that the need for oil is actually going to overshadow any talk of recognition of Israel building on the Abraham Accords. What, what do you hope to see out of his trip uh, to Saudi Arabia? Well, first, he needs to repair the relationship with Saudi Arabia. I think he needs to give the respect to the crown prince that he took away. I, need to think, I think he needs to give the respect to the kingdom of Saudi Arabia that he took away by calling it a pariah. Um, I don't expect any major moves by Saudi Arabia on this trip. Perhaps they'll come away with some some sort of steps, which I think would be a positive thing and uh, good for him if he could build on what President Trump did. But I do think the most important thing he could deal with in the region entirely is the Iran threat to the region. That is what his focus should be on this on this trip. Well, so far, the administration doesn't seem to have taken the Iran threat uh, very seriously. They've actually re reopened. Uh, recently, they've said, well, we're not going to be able to get to an agreement. But do they understand the historical importance of trying to get an alliance with the Sunni Arab nations in the Gulf and, and try to form a coalition that would stop Iran? No, I don't think they do. They pay a little bit of lip service to that, but we're still very tied to the Europeans. Think about our weakness. Look at the weakness we show Iran. We're negotiating, or until very recently, we were negotiating through a European proxy. We can't even be in the room to make our own demands. We ex appear very, very weak. The Europeans are just not relevant to this equation. They're not on the threat. They're not on the line of fire that the Middle East is. We should be only tying ourselves to the Middle Eastern countries who are in the direct line of fire. Uh, the Europeans have their own problem in their own backyard. And look what's happening now. Iran is helping Russia attack Ukraine. So they're destabilizing. Iran is destabilizing Europe. And the Europeans want to make a deal with Iran was threatening the Middle East. The Europeans are just not the right people that we should be partnering with on this. Uh, how close do you think Iran is to actually developing a nuclear weapon? And if they do uh, get one in the, in the near term, what does that do to the region? Very hard to tell how close they are. I mean, Israel has released some intelligence. Uh, they had some this uh, unbelievable uh, trove of intelligence that they managed to get a couple of years ago when President Trump was the president. It showed that Iran was tr was cheating on the JCPOA, even though technically the JCPOA wasn't active at the time. But they, they can get pretty close, and uh, that's why the region is so worried. And that's why Europe is really just not relevant. Iran is a menace to the region, not just with respect to nuclear weapons, by the way. We gave them a ton of money when we, gave, when we signed the JCPOA under Barack Obama. And uh, they use their terrorist proxies to attack Israel, to attack the UAE, to attack Saudi Arabia and others. They make mischief in Morocco, all sorts of places. So I don't think this administration really recognizes the threat that it is. I think we sort of bury our heads in the sand and think that if we could solve the problem for a couple of years, that's a good thing. But what do we tell our kids uh, years later? That we solved the problem for a couple of years, but we pretended to ignore it for their benefit? Very, very bad strategy.
Well, I think Europe is getting involved now because Iran is, is sending drones to help Russia in the war in Ukraine. And, and you, you just look at their export of terrorism, their export of weapons, uh, and, and they are a threat to the entire world. Let, let's turn to Israel for a moment. You helped draft the deal of the century to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And now the Biden administration, it, it seems like they want to go back to a two-state solution. Uh, I, I'm, I've been asking repeatedly, is a two-state solution even viable on the ground anymore? Uh, do you think it can work? No, and I'll tell you why. Because the phrase really means nothing, right? Or I should say it means different things to different people. Until you get down into the details, what does that mean for Israel's security? Are you really going to give the Palestinians a complete sovereign state where they can use that as a launching ground to attack Israel the way Gaza, once Israel left Gaza, the way Hamas, the terrorists, the Iran-funded terrorists, have attacked Israel. The devil's always in the detail here, and that's why we drafted such a long, comprehensive plan. Yes, we all want peace, and yes, we all want the Palestinians to have better lives, but you got to sit down and do the work and understand what it means. So at the moment, I don't think any solution is viable. I don't think the Palestinian leadership in Ramallah is interested, and certainly the terrorist thugs in Gaza are not interested. But even if somehow you miraculously got them to the table, you got to get through the very hard details of defining what that Palestinian state really means and how to make sure our important friend and ally Israel never has to worry that it's going to be attacked by the Palestinians. Oh, well said. Well, the book is called In the Path of Abraham, and you can find it wherever books are sold. Jason Greenblatt, thanks for joining us and thanks for your insight. Thanks for having me. She left home and never came back. Mandy Lemaire was 11 years old when she just vanished. Her father was hoping against hope that his daughter would be found. And after 10 days, she was found about a mile from her house. The guy says, what's going on? I says, my daughter's missing. He was with the volunteer fire department. He says, you say the word, we'll start a search. Dave Lemaire raised his family in the small town of Taslina, Alaska. He loved the outdoor adventures he shared with his daughter, Mandy. Mandy was uh, the combination of a pretty little girl and an outdoor tomboy. She was my fishing buddy. She was my hunting buddy. August 22nd, 1991. 11-year-old Mandy LaMare left her home to meet a friend at a meeting point halfway between their houses. Mandy never arrived. Her friend Aaron had made it all the way to our house and didn't see Mandy. I got on the four-wheeler and went driving the route that she should have gone, and she wasn't there. I, I started realizing there's something seriously wrong. Dave contacted search and rescue crews, who immediately combed through the nearby Alaskan wilderness. Meanwhile, he flew over the area in a friend's plane, but there was no sign of Mandy. And it's pouring down rain. And now I'm thinking about the possibilities she's out there. She's hypothermic. And I, I'm praying, God, protect her. Help us find her in the morning. My head is spinning, and I'm trying to keep rational thoughts going. The search continued for 10 excruciating days. Then, while driving, Dave was flagged down by a volunteer fire truck. We stopped and I got out and walked back to him and he says, we found her. And I got excited, he says, but she's dead. And my heart sank and I just sat in shock for a 35 minute drive back to the house. Of how could this be? Mandy's body was found in a secluded wooded area about a mile from her house. She had been sexually assaulted and shot. With no suspects, Dave was overwhelmed and angry. As time went along, I would go to town and I would say, well, I see my daughter's killer in the grocery store, and will I know it? So this cloud kind of followed me. Somebody's getting away with murder. And then I started doing a very wrong thing right here in my head. I started daydreaming about what I would do if it was my turn 
and my opportunity to punish this person. And I came up with very, very awful things. And I drove myself almost to the verge of a nervous breakdown. Dave's anger took a toll on his already shattered life as he waited for justice and longed for revenge. I was struggling on how to continue trusting God. I'd go to church, but really I was there as a payoff to God. Like, if I'm doing this, no, no more bad things are gonna happen. And slowly I shut down. Not that I completely would walk away from God, but where I'd come to the point of, I'd ask myself, can I really trust God in this point? Three months after Mandy's disappearance, Charles Smithhart, a local resident, was arrested and charged with sexual assault and first degree murder. A jury found him guilty and sentenced him to 114 years behind bars. Yet it was Dave who remained in an emotional prison. I had built a wall for myself. One angry thought, one bad thought after another. And I built this wall of really ugly things. And I felt like I had him in a prison. And by now I've came to the point that I'm having a hard time finding joy in life. And I knew that I had to come to forgiveness. Forgiveness meant that I let God be God and God be the judge. When I came to that point, I tore down that ugly wall and I found out the prisoner had been me. And all this time, I hadn't hurt him one little bit, but I almost ruined me. Choosing to forgive restored Dave's love for God and renewed his joy in life. If God hadn't helped me to come to that point of forgiveness, I believe I'd be a very bitter man, a very angry man, but I found now I can enjoy the simple things in life again. Kids laughing and playing, seeing God's beauty and God's handiwork. Also, if you think about the fact, I'm going to have an eternity with her. So the time that I've lost here on earth, although I've lost greatly, will be very, very minute to the time that I'm going to have with her in eternity. And I can just visualize the time that I come there. And I'm going to be greeted by the Jesus who loved me enough to hang on a cross and die for me. And behind him will be a beautiful blonde-haired saint, be running towards me, bouncing up and down, and singing, Daddy's home, Daddy's home, Daddy's home. That is a powerful story, isn't it? But it's a story of freedom. It's a story of hope and redemption. It's a story of tremendous pain and loss. You know, we live, friends, in a fallen world. We don't get heaven here. We get it when we go there. And so it's very hard sometimes to understand to manage, to accept, to surrender to the wickedness that's a part of such a beautiful world. You know, Dave talked about now he can appreciate all of that again. But when we're all entangled up in unforgiveness and bitterness and resentment, we lose the ability to see the beauty in the world God created. You know what? God sees all of that ugliness too for a season, for just a season, we are here. And what we do here has everything to do with where we go when we leave here and what our journey here is like. You know, I, I, I say this all the time, but it's really true. Jesus said, I came to set the captive free. You know, we're, we're captive to so many things here. We're captive to being sinners ourselves. 
were captive to what Dave experienced. The bitterness and resentment when unjust things are done to someone we love. Sometimes it's to us. Some of you can relate to that. And we know that Jesus says that we're to forgive. You know that he came to offer forgiveness to us and then we in turn are to offer it to ourselves, to him when we need to, to others. But sometimes it feels like we're saying what was done was okay. And then there's always the issue of, you know, God, where were you in all of this? When I was hurting, when my child was hurting, where, when the one I love was hurting, where were you? The Bible says he's always there. It doesn't say that we won't go through difficulties. In fact, it says we will. But he'll walk through them with us. And when it says we come to the other side of a fire walked through by him and we will not even smell like smoke, it's because he offers us the freedom from that. You, you don't come through it without experience. You don't come through it without pain and hurt. But you come through it with a freedom and a wisdom and a sense of hope on the other side. When you insist on holding resentment and bitterness, you can't get there from here. Even though it feels like you're saying what happened was okay, the forgiveness is not about the event. It's not even about the other person. It's about you and me. And will we let God free us from a jail that we are creating for ourselves. I can't say it better than Dave did. When we hang on to that stuff, it's not the other person who's hurt. We hurt us. We block everything that heaven created for us to have and to be when we insist on building those walls. Maybe today there's something in your life. It might not be as desperate a situation as Dave experienced, but his message is for you and for me. Maybe there's something in your life and you're hanging on to it because it feels just to do that. What was done was so unjust, unfair, cost you things, ruined things in your life. I want to say to you today, you can be free. You can be free. You know, we talk about the fact that when we invite Jesus into our hearts, he gives us a start over. You get a start over every day if you want one. Today, right now, do what Dave did. Just let it go. Not because it didn't matter, but because instead of doing this, you're doing this to the only one who can set you free. Just pray with me right now. Let's pray together. Jesus, you are the savior of my soul and the redeemer of everything in my life that has been lost. I feel so much anger and bitterness and resentment. I haven't known where to go with it all, but today, Jesus, I'm giving it to you. I'm just giving it to you. I'm taking this burden off my back and I'm putting it on the altar before you because you are a just God. You say vengeance is mine, I will repay, so I give it to you, God. You are a just God. And so I'm giving this burden to you and I'm asking you to set me free. Set me free today. I receive that gift of freedom and I forgive. I choose to forgive. God, help my heart and my mind to catch up with my words. Set me free so I can love you, so I can be filled with hope, so I can see the beauty of the world around me. I want to live fully in this life until I come to be with you in the next. So Jesus, take it today. Take it today and set me free. And I pray this in your name. Amen. If you've prayed that prayer, you are free.
you are free. The one the sun sets free, the word says, is free indeed. Nothing can hold you anymore. I want to say if you're still struggling with forgiveness, we want to send you this. It's been put together called forgiveness. God's power in your life. You see, it takes that for us to let go, doesn't it? I'd like you to have this. It's free. <laughs> so is the phone call to get it. 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I'd like the information on forgiveness. We'll send it to you right away. Welcome back to the 700 Club for the CBN News Break. A fast-burning wildfire near California's Yosemite National Park threatens some of the oldest trees in the world. The Washburn Fire has already consumed more than 2,300 acres, and more than 1,600 people have been ordered to evacuate the area as 500 firefighters battle the blaze. The flames are nearing the historic sequoias in Yosemite. Crews are placing sprinklers to soak the trees and create more humidity. The fire so far is only about 25% contained. What no eye has seen before. NASA released the first of several images sent by its deep space telescope. What you're looking at is the deepest and most detailed view of the universe ever recorded, including clusters of galaxies. NASA's administrator said we are looking back more than 13 billion years. The agency compares this sliver of the universe to a grain of sand held at arm's length by someone on the ground. The image, taken by the James Webb Telescope, which sits one million miles from Earth and orbits the sun, NASA will release more images today. That's pretty amazing. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. MRI can still remember the scariest sound she's ever heard. It came from the alarm on her phone. A tornado was headed in her direction, and she needed to find shelter fast. The rest of my family was asleep, and I got an alarm on my phone to take shelter. I woke my mom up, we went to the bathroom. We were just really just concerned for our safety. My main concern was making sure that my mom and my sister and I were going to be okay. Just minutes after Amariah heard the alarm, an EF3 tornado touched down near her family's home in Russellville, Kentucky. It was the scariest sound I've ever heard. I just could feel panic enter my body. The only thing that we could do was pray to God that our family would be safe and that this wouldn't be our last moments together. God was there for us, watching over us the entire time. Amariah and her mother and sister were all unharmed from the tornado. Insurance covered the damage to the roof, but not the damage to the inside of the house. Her mom is disabled due to a back injury and can't do much of the work herself. My mom has always made it work, being a single mom and being disabled. The financial strain that it has put on us, seeing my mom have to deal with that has been really hard. So Operation Blessing offered to help. God's role in bringing Operation Blessing here has strengthened my faith because he brought an organization here to help us and make things easier for us. Thanks to Operation Blessing Partners, we repaired the ceiling, installed new insulation, replaced the ruined drywall, put in new flooring, and gave the family a new washer and dryer. When we have no hope for what's to come next, there's generous people like the people of Operation Blessing who can come together and give us a sense of normalcy and just bring it back to what it was before. We are so, so thankful and grateful for the help that you all have provided for us. No words can explain how grateful we are. So we just want to say thank you. That thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club, whether it's helping refugees in Ukraine or victims of a horrible tornado in, in Kentucky. We want to be there for people. We want to be there in their time of need to let them know that God loves them. We love them. We want to help them. If that's you, be a part of it. Be a part of the 700 Club. Call us and say, yes, I'd like to join. It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. If you're already a 700 Club member, I encourage you to increase. Go to 700 Club Gold, which is $40 a month. There's also a 1,000 Club, and that's $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call, I've got something for you, and we need this in these turbulent times, putting on the armor of God. It's my father's latest teaching on the book of Ephesians, how to stand firm in God's protection and power. 
It's yours when you join the 700 Club. So do it now. 1-800-700-7000. Over the course of several months, Sandra was hospitalized multiple times. Her body was ravaged by the effects of cancers. Well, doctors kept telling her she had no chance for a cure. And see how Sandra survived to tell her story. I had a cough that was incessant. It just didn't go away. At first, Sandra Stebbing wasn't too concerned about the cough that started in May of 2017. The vibrant 69-year-old had been the picture of health. Her doctor said it was allergies, even though it kept getting worse. I was almost having such seizures of coughing that it would almost make me want to throw up. I had lost my appetite, so I wasn't really eating well. I was so weak, I could just barely get from point A to point B in the house. Rocked with pain, losing weight, uh, freezing, could not warm her body up. Over the next year, Sandra was hospitalized half a dozen times. When I went into the hospital one time, they gave me three pints of blood. That's because my blood count was so low. We got to the point where nothing was really helping. Finally, in July 2017, doctors did a bone marrow biopsy that revealed she had a fatal illness. The doctor walked in the room and he said, I am so very sorry to tell you this, but you've been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. But he continued to tell me that um, there was no cure for what I had and no chance for my recovery. The recommended treatment, chemo, would only delay the inevitable. So Sandra sought options from several hospitals, including a hospital known for its premier leukemia center. I was so exhausted and so down, and all I had was now a second bad report confirming the first one. Refusing to give up, Sandra began looking for hospitals conducting clinical trials. All of them told her she did not meet the basic health criteria to be accepted. Yet, in the midst of her bad reports, Sandra said she heard a word from the Lord. One thing that bubbled up in my spirit, <laughs> and it was so clear, was in Psalms it says, I will live and not die and declare the wonderful works of the Lord. We are going to do everything we can to find a way to be healed. For Sandra and Barry, doing everything they could meant going to the Lord in prayer. As they called on family, friends, and their church to join them, Sandra would spend every day praying healing scriptures out loud, while Barry cried out to God constantly for his wife of 30 years. The prayer was relentless and fervent. Many times she would wake me up moaning and crying, for I had to take her hand and pray for her. Over the next seven months, Sandra was hospitalized multiple times for pneumonia. By then, she was also receiving blood transfusions to ease the ravages of cancer, if only for a short while. Everything inside of me was, was so depleted um, that I was just being kept alive by the grace of God at that point. We reached the point where there was nothing left in either one of us. She said, I can't pray anymore. I said, I can't either. By now, thousands of people on social media had joined in prayer and were believing for a miracle. Then in December 2017, Sandra received a word of hope through the 700 Club. We agree with those who are looking for healing. So for this leukemia, for the any kind of lung problem, any kind of cancer, Lord, we come into agreement with them right now. And we say to their bodies, be healed and be made whole by the stripes of Jesus Christ. So I took that word from me and I rejoiced. A few days later, while getting another blood transfusion, Sandra's doctor told her about a renowned hematologist who was conducting clinical research on stem cell treatments for leukemia patients. He agreed to treat her, confident there was a 50% chance of success. But first, she had to pass a barrage of tests and find a donor. She got both. In fact, 
the donor was a perfect match, Sandra's younger brother, Scott. Three months later, Sandra went in for the transplant. Very slowly, the physical changes started manifesting. Um, I began to have more strength. I began feeling better right away. Then, just one year after Sandra was told she was dying, she received a report from her transplant doctor. Sandra was in remission. I was just filled with thanksgiving to God. And just turning your body, this vessel, over to Christ and taking his word and standing on it and having an unflinching faith that won't move. Since 2018, Sandra has shown no signs of leukemia and is again the picture of health, enjoying life with Barry on their beautiful North Carolina farm. So regardless of the report, just hang on to the word of the Lord, the promises of God. They will accomplish their purpose if you believe. God wants to do, you, do miracles. He wants to use doctors to perform miracles. And it's wonderful what he's given us. He's given us all these things. When you look at the history of medicine, it's all based on uh, these wonderful hospitals that were created by Christians who said, let's go heal the sick. Let's do that. Let's do that in his name. That's the commandment of Jesus to go proclaim to people that the kingdom of heaven has drawn near to them. Heal the sick. These are, these are the, his instructions to his disciples. So let's do that. Let's join together. Let's say, how can we provide for those who are sick, who are suffering, and how can we provide healing for them? We believe in prayer here, so we're going to be praying for you. Before we pray, we've got some other answers to prayer. Here's one. Twelve years ago, Ruth suffered complications from surgery, which then led to bladder issues. She was watching this show. Terry said, a woman with incontinence, you have no control of your bladder. Right now, God is strengthening those muscles, and you will no longer have that problem. By faith... Ruth believed and felt a sense of power. She called CBN's prayer center to report that she is completely healed. Wow, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Well, this is Marianne. She lives in East Mauritius, New York. She suffered from significant pain throughout her body, including her neck, her back, her knees. Her vision was also worsening due to cataracts. Marianne was watching this program and she heard me say, for a person struggling with arthritis, not just in one place, it's throughout your body, just a general achiness that's always there. God is healing you right now. Just feel his healing coming into your body and setting you free. And then Gordon, you said spinal conditions. Some of you, it's the top of your neck. Some of you, it's your lower back. Right now, just feel that pressure as the hand of Jesus Jesus touches your spine. He's setting you free from that. And then you said, several people with vision problems related to cataracts. God is healing your eyes right now and restoring perfect vision to you. By faith, Marianne believed for healing. Immediately, her pain disappeared and she could see clearly out of both eyes. Miraculous, really. Get a picture of God and get a picture of heaven. God in heaven, is there anything wrong? The answer is no. Is anything out of order? No, it's not. Is anybody sick? No. Is anybody lonely? Is anybody poor? Is any, anybody having anxiety attacks? Is, is there any stress? The answer to that is all no. It's not allowed in heaven. Isn't that wonderful? It's not allowed. The peace of God reigns. The will of God reigns. So come into his will. The kingdom of heaven is drawing near to you. Come into his will. Reach up and grab it. This is what Jesus proclaimed. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Change what you think and believe the good news. Believe that Jesus came for you. Believe that all your sins are forgiven. He doesn't hold anything against you. Believe that he wants to welcome you, his child, back into his arm. Believe that by his stripes you are healed. 
The same sacrifice that forgave all your sins is the same sacrifice that heals all your diseases. Walk into that. Be free in that. And let's pray. Lord, we come together. We come together in unity, believing. And we reach forth with hands of faith to touch that area of the body that needs healing. And we come together in agreement. And we say out loud over it, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The will of God is being done in my body as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. No more pain, no more infirmity, no more sickness, because heaven has come to me, and the will of God is being done in my body. I receive it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Terry God spoken to you. No, there, this is not one person. This is many people. You have macular degeneration. Some of you have dry macular degeneration. Some of you have wet macular degeneration. But God is healing your eyes right now. They're, they're going to begin to water, and you're, it's just going to be healed. In Jesus' name, no more dark black spots for you. Uh, there's someone you had a, 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 a have a kidney problem in your right kidney. And somehow or other, that infection has gotten into the abdominal cavity and is just starting to ravage your whole body. God is healing you of that infection right now. Uh, all the sepsis, all the pain, all that problem is leaving you. He's giving you a brand new kidney. He's washing out all that infection right now. In Jesus' name, be healed and be made whole. Yes, someone else, you have infection in your spinal cord, and it's life-threatening. God is healing that for you right now. It's just that healing power is coming into your body and setting you free in Jesus' name. Uh, there's someone you've been lifting boxes, and both of your shoulders are, are hurting. There's been an ongoing issue with bursitis and, and um some kind of frozen shoulder problem. It's primarily in your right, but it affects both of them in Jesus' name. Be healed. All arthritis be gone from you now in the name of Jesus. May you have freedom of movement. That's right. You just felt that go into both your shoulders. Lift your hands to him. Begin to praise him for what he's doing for you. Receive a new heart today, a new outlook, a new joy on life. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been touched, if you've been healed, let us know. Give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. And we're here for you 24 hours a day. We believe in prevailing prayer, the prayer that gets an answer. Here's a word from Mark. If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. God bless. We'll see you again tomorrow.